about some of the functional assessment tools, but what I want to make sure we do is we leave with sort of that nice clinical toolbox of things that you can use, you know, sort of Monday morning or next time you're in clinic that will help you start to get a sense of your patient's experience. There's a, an approach to pain assessment that's, uh, that's been talked about called uh, problem-oriented pain management or pain assessment. And one of, the, one of the questions, one of the central questions that are asked in this problem-oriented approach is, the patient says, my primary goal is to reduce my pain. The follow-up question is, what would you be doing differently, or what would having less pain allow you to do? So that kind of thing. What would you be doing differently if you had less pain, or what would having less pain allow you to do that you're not doing now? And what you're trying to do there is get the patient to tell you more about the interference as a result of their pain, the functional limitations, the things they'd like to be doing Especially if we recognize that in a lot of cases, complete pain abolishment is not an appropriate outcome. It's not an appropriate goal. That people are continue to, going to continue to have pain. But what we hope we can often do is help them achieve more in spite of their pain. This is where that self-efficacy thing comes in. Again. So I'm going to finish off as far as pain assessment tools with the pain-related interference and disability scales that we can use. So what we're going to do here for this final module is to understand the value of including pain-related function and disability scales in your assessment repertoire, to become familiar with some of the common scales that we can use, to explore the relative merits and limitations of uh, aggregate scores versus individual item analysis, and as I say, we're going to finish off by building a baseline assessment toolkit that you can use in your own setting. One of the most important things I think we've come to realize is that pain is not disability and vice versa. So pain and disability are not the same thing. That it's possible to have pain but not feel especially disabled by it. Similarly, it's possible to feel really rather disabled or functionally impaired but not really have a pile of pain. And there's been lots of discussion around why that is. Fear of pain is one of those that frequently comes into this discussion. In fact, uh, I think it was Waddell who said the fear of pain is more disabling than the pain itself. That you may not currently have any pain right now, but that's because you're not doing anything. And you're afraid of doing something that might cause you to feel pain. Okay, so in that case, it's not so much the pain that needs to be the target of treatment, it's more the fear of pain. Okay. Normally, there is a, there's an association between pain and disability, depending on what condition we're looking at. It's ranges from sort of moderate, sort of small to moderate, so an R, if you think about your Pierce's R correlation, is about 0.4, which is not terribly strong, to about 0.7. In other words, they're, they're connected, they're associated, but they're not the same thing. The pain and disability are not the same thing. I mentioned earlier this, this finding. 21% 20, of patients presenting to primary care for pain-related interference problems scored 0 to 10 when asked about pain in the waiting room. So again, we can't infer one by knowing the other. And as we say, pain can be present in the absence of disability. Disability can be present in the absence of pain. And both really should be captured. When we're talking about pain-related functional interference, um, I'm going to try and make this really simple. We can talk about it in two broad sort of categories. We've got region-specific scales which are scales intended specifically to measure disability or pain-related impairments in a specific uh, region of the body. So the neck, the low back, the arm, the wrist, the leg. There are a number of different ones. Thoracic uh, spine. Then there are generic scales that are intended to kind of give you this broad overview. These are things that we think everybody wants to be able to do. Walk, sleep, take care of themselves. It doesn't matter the condition, it doesn't matter the region, but we can pretty well apply this across any region. Okay? So I've got a couple of examples here, some of you will be familiar with. Uh, neck disability index, the Roland Morris for uh, low back disability, uh, the DASH is one the disability of the arm, shoulder, and hand, the upper extremity functional index is again for the upper extremity, low extremity functional scale, patient rated risk evaluation, there are a number of these out there. 
I put these, these are some of the more common ones, at least in physio uh, lingo. And then we've got some generic ones. The brief pain inventory, the pain disability index, uh, patient specific functional scale, satisfaction recovery index, and Canadian occupational performance measure. I put in for the OTs and COPN, uh, an OT related one. Just by I can show yeah, here we go. By show of hands, have people come across those region specific ones before? The NDI, the Roland Morris. <coughs> Yeah. For the clinicians here, not uh, not the students, I guess at this point, do people use these routinely? Yeah. If we were to talk about the relative merits of using, let's talk, let's look specifically let's talk about the region-specific scales, sort of in contrast to the generic scales. First of all, on balance, why do we why bother collecting either of these? I've already said that pain and disability are two different things. If we focus just on the pain itself, I really think we're missing a big part of the pie, a big part of why the patient's coming in to see you, which is, is because it's preventing them from doing something. It's preventing them from achieving something, from becoming something, from fulfilling some role, whatever it is. Okay? So I would encourage um, you to all consider strongly, when you are assessing a patient in pain, to not just collect the pain intensity, location, quality stuff, but also to collect some kind of pain-related interference scale. Now that said, there's this sort of there's a trade-off between the region-specific scales and the generic scales. If you had to guess on what some of the values are of these region-specific scales, what some of the merits are. So for example, the neck disability index has questions like uh, reading, driving, lifting, working, recreational activities, and how much interference you're experiencing there. What do you think are the merits of using one of these region-specific scales versus just some generic scale, which would be, you know, walking, sleeping, I don't know, uh, concentration, that sort of thing. Why would, we, why would someone, make, someone make an argument for me of using a region-specific scale? So you can plan treatment around what they can't do. I would agree, although I'd also say that to the generic scales, you might be able to do the same thing, depending on the item on there. The patients like it? Because they feel like these are, yeah, these are actually things that are important to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what you're going to say, They may get like frustrated if there's questions that are not even relevant to their situation. They may get frustrated if there are questions that are not relevant to their situation. Completely agree. And it should be more sensitive to change because the questions are relevant to them. And the thought is that they're more sensitive to change because on a generic scale, there may be questions that are not relevant, right? So they'll never change. It doesn't matter. Why well, ask about walking ability for somebody who has neck pain? Maybe it's not. Not relevant. Okay. Someone make an argument for me, however, of using more of a generic scale. What are the arguments there? Yeah? There's a what, sorry? There's, there's, yeah, there may be a quality of life aspect to it. Yeah, absolutely. You could, you could maybe make that argument for region-specific scales as well, but perhaps, perhaps more so for generic scales. Yeah. What would be another argument for using just a generic scale? What about you? Is let's say, let's say the novice clinicians in here. If I said here's one scale that applies across every condition, or here's four different scales that you can use depending on your condition. Is that a value? Do you think? I suppose I could see that maybe you only really need to know about one scale and the properties of one scale rather than knowing the properties of four or five different scales. So that may be a, a merit. Any other arguments for using a generic scale, you think? Not that if you're, maybe you're not sure of a diagnosis, you're, you can't pinpoint it to one place. Okay. Or if it's a more neuropathic. Sure. Yeah. So uh, if you're not if you're not really sure what the region is that's the problem, you know, maybe they're complaining about lateral elbow pain, but you think it might actually be a neck related problem or something like that, then it doesn't matter. Maybe you can just give them a generic scale, then you sort of address that problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you pretty well hit on probably both sides of the argument here, for the most part. Um, it's generally thought that the region-specific scales are more acceptable uh, in that 
they include items that really should be more relevant to people specifically with a knee problem or a back problem. On the other hand, you've got your generic scales that allow you to compare across clinical conditions. That might actually be somewhat interesting. Um, plus, they tend to be a little bit more just kind of, as, as Ian said earlier, just kind of more broad, sweeping, kind of a more of a quality of life, perhaps, sort of aspect to them. 